I don't believe that any dream is smaller or bigger than anyone else's dream. And so I tried to, to create something that was bigger than me, which is Dream Nation. And the goal is to inspire everyone to live a life by their design, no matter what their dream is. Welcome to Sharp Podcast, where we have one aim, to help you get better at the stuff that you have to do and spend more time doing the stuff that you want to do. Hang on a minute. That, that's two. That's two aims. For goodness sake, can't we even get the intro right? Sorry, we'll try that again. In the meantime, enjoy the episode. Welcome to episode 72. Now, If you heard the last episode, you may remember that I said back then that we've got a great one coming up. And we have, and this is it. This podcast aims to help you and other people, but mainly you, get better at the stuff that you have to do so you can spend more time doing the things you want to do. Now, sometimes the tools and techniques that we give you can be enough. But it's also good to get some inspiration. And Casanova Brooks is a fireball of inspiration. If you don't know Casanova, here's a list of what he does. He's an investor. He runs a seven-figure real estate business. He's a speaker. He's got two podcasts. He talks about goals, relationships, self-development, the bulletproof mindset. He's the CEO of the Dream Nation Academy. And he's a dad. And we chatted about all those things. We talk about being a parent and how his son and his daughter inspire him and make him laugh. We talk about growing up without having a dad, being a cancer survivor, trading time for money and how to move away from it. We learn what the game Monopoly had to do with his success in real estate. And also, the real estate isn't his why. We talked about building relationships, big, hairy, audacious goals why podcasting gives him the most satisfaction, of course, and his view on work-life balance or work-life harmony as he describes it. In this episode, we mention loads of books and resources as well and we'll put all the links in the show notes if you want to find out more. Now this is a full episode and it's a great conversation. There's loads here to get your teeth into. So, pin back your ears, prepare to receive some energy Here's Casanova Brooks. I have at the other end of the line after some um, interesting, challenging technical difficulties, uh, and he has somehow managed to sort them out. He's clearly cleverer than me. Um, It's Casanova Brooks. Casanova, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? (laughs) I can. We can now stop saying, can you hear me? (laughs) Because it's all good. Oh, I am so excited to talk to you. Honestly, in the last few days, having found out what you do, what you're about, uh, what uh, what what you've done with your life, it's going to be super cool for my audience to hear um, here at Sharp Podcast. There is so much I want to delve in to, and uh, it's amazing to hear you, to hear you to have you at the end of the line. I'm, I, maybe I'll just try and uh, try and do, just be a bit more relaxed and a bit more chilled. You can teach me. You can teach me how to be chilled. Do you do chilled? I do do chilled. It's funny. I just had, uh, I've had those experiences as well. I think when I've had some big guests on the show, and I think when you first get those people on, you've been following them, you follow their work, you, you're you inspired by them, you're inspired by so many things about them. And I yeah. think it's hard, just human nature to not get excited. And so I know exactly what you feel. I just had Grant Cardone on my show last week. Okay. And uh, yeah, that was a phenomenal episode. And I've had a lot of other big people that I think have really helped to get me to this point. So I felt those same feelings. And I just I'm appreciative of it because I know what it's like to be on that side. I have to admit that there aren't very many people that I, I watch on video or listen to on podcasts, where I can feel the energy coming down the line, you're like a ball of fire. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really powerful stuff. So um, you're Casanova Brooks. You, I know that you're from Chicago. Are you in Chicago still? No, I'm actually in Omaha, Nebraska now. 
So okay. that's a yeah, huge change. I mean, it's still the Midwest. A lot of people know Omaha because of the Oracle, Warren Buffett. Okay. But yeah, that's where I reside now. I've been here for the last six and a half years. And yeah, it's definitely been a community that's blessed me and blessed my family. Wow. Well, this is what I've learned about you so far, and I probably haven't even scratched the surface. For the benefit of my audience that may not yet have come across your work, I have discovered that you are an investor, a real estate agent. You are the owner of the Bulletproof Mindset and Ready Fire Aim, which I'm really very interested to find out about. You're a podcaster, and you're greedy because one podcast is not enough. You've got two podcasts. You talk about self-development. Uh, you're the CEO of the Dream Nation Academy. You look at building relationships, skills, goals. You're a speaker. Uh, man, is there anything you don't do? Um, yeah, I do a lot. I, I love it because I feel like everything makes me come alive. But I would say the one thing that I don't do that I give credit to my wife is I don't, I, I definitely could never be a mother, right? I'm a great parent. I feel like as a father, but the things that I think I don't do a lot of the times I think about my wife, she has the hardest job. And that is being a caretaker to not only our two kids who uh -huh. are bun a bundle of joy and definitely a lot of firepower is, which is where I probably try to stay sharp. But I would say um, th that's probably the area that I look at and I say, man, I don't know if I could ever do that. And I don't know if you <laughs> have kids or yeah. how many kids that you have, but she manages right now. We opened up a daycare center. This was 15 okay. months ago. So right before the pandemic, and yeah. we took it from zero to 70 kids. And I say we, wow. but it's really her. And so, I mean, every single day she has a new challenge on her plate. And I don't know if that's one thing that I ever could do, even if I wanted to. 70, seven zero. Seven zero, yeah. My life, no. I, sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't do that. We have we have three children, but they're all you know, sort of um, teenager. My daughter's twenty one at university. The boys are teenagers, um, and uh, and we've moved on from young kids. How old are yours? My son is nine years old, and my daughter's three years old. Wow, the best time. Yeah, and it is. There is something about being a dad, isn't there? There's something quite empowering about being a dad and uh, and finding your way with that. That's like a whole new world, isn't it? You feel like you own the world and then suddenly you become a dad and you just start learning again. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, I, I grew up without my dad. So for yeah. anybody who knows anything about my story, um, and, and we do, I could, if you want, we can go deeper into this a little bit later. But for me, I grew up without a dad. And I think it really came to an epiphany or a way to, for me to articulate it about a year ago. And I saw a quote, and it said, you know, if I didn't come from a wealthy family, that a wealthy family must come from me. And I was like, oh, that's good, right? It, it was something that, mm -hmm. being that I didn't come from a wealthy family, I'm originally from South Side of Chicago. Yeah. And my dad was never in my life. I'm raised by a single mom. I was the only child on my mom's side. But last I knew, I had 13 brothers and sisters on my dad's side. Wow. So I was like, okay. So I really wanted to find something that more so resonated with who I am, what is my mission, what is my purpose. So I actually changed it up. And I said, if I don't come from a loving father, that a loving father must come from me. Okay. And so- that was the thing that when we talk about kids and both of my children are miracle babies because of the storms that I went through in my life. And mm. more importantly, towards them, me being a stage four cancer survivor, that's how um, I really have cherished both of them because they both came out naturally healthy. It did take us two years to have both of our kids. But I think that all the while, it just really told me that, you know, joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for a little bit of adversity. Oh, I agree. And what an amazing story. We can really get into some of the detail there because there's some really interesting stuff to to find out about. And that's a that's a phenomenal story. Now, I don't know if you've if you've heard any of the interviews at Sharp Podcast. We always start the conversation with the same question. So we've talked about how how big your world is and how much stuff there is going on and, and how busy you are, and we'll get into the detail there. But the most important question on all of our listeners' um, minds at the moment is do you have socks on? Absolutely. What color are your socks? Black. Okay. And are you kind of a uniform guy that your socks are always the same color or do you change it up? Tell me about your sock uh, strategy. 
Yeah, so no, I'm pretty uniform. It's black or white, but I am at a company that I own a real estate brokerage, and the colors for that is blue and orange. So I do switch it up, and I'll wear those blue or orange socks. I'm not a Denver. If you follow U.S. sports and and if you follow uh, the Denver Broncos, those are their colors. Those aren't my colors, but the (laughs) fact that those are the colors of the company, I do rock it. Well, it's it's really important for people to find out what color um, what color socks our guests have on um, because I think it tells you a lot about a person. If you if you if you've got uniform colors, uh, that suggests to me that attention to detail is high on your agenda. You need to look smart. It's important to present yourself well. You certainly do in every single video and picture I've seen of you. Is that a standard for you? Yeah, I would say so. I think you know I've always understood that my brand was the thing that's going to live on no matter what. I could choose to pivot. I could choose to transition into another industry, another business venture. But at the end of the day, it was all about, you know, how do I look? How do I articulate myself? And what's my integrity like? What's the feeling or the memory that I always leave someone with? And so I've always wanted to make sure that I could stand out from the crowd. And I'm definitely not the tallest. I'm actually a shorter guy and I'm not the strongest. I'm, you know, I got a pretty fit body. But at the end of the day, what are the things that I could do that just presented me well? Because one of the things that I learned early on was that you do not get a second chance to make a first impression. And so that was something that even I I mean, if we could go back, I think when I was around 23, 24 years old, I was actually first time introduced to network marketing. And one of my what they would call a sponsor, the guy who brought me in, a really, really great guy. And, you know, with network marketing, no matter what the business venture is, a lot of the times you're trying to paint the picture of the dream that somebody can change their lifestyle, you know, and become a millionaire, whatever else. And so I brought one of my good buddies to one of these what they call like the weekly meeting or, you know, the to show the plan. And so he had asked me at the end of it, my buddy did, he said, you know, about your sponsor, he says, what has he done? Basically asking what has he done in terms of the money and everything else that he's trying to pitch. And I was still young at this because it was my first time being exposed to personal development. So I don't, I was like, I don't, I don't really know. And I was kind of saying what I thought that he did. And he was like, listen, He's like, this isn't always the case, but 95% of the time, you can judge a man by two things. Number one is their timepiece, and number two is the food or the, the shoes that they have on their feet. And so I started to really look at those things. And it was funny because over the next five years, I really got heavy into like tailor suits and things like that. But it was just my perception of someone. Now, again, that is a blanket statement because some people they'll have, you know, the dingiest shoes or they might not even have, you know, a timepiece. They might choose to just be comfortable. For, but for a lot of the times, and I'm not saying be over you know, uh, zealous or super extravagant trying to buy things that are $10,000 Rolexes or something. But a lot of the times it's just, it, it really goes into what I feel is the pride that they take into themselves. Are they well cut? Do they keep nice clothes on? And it doesn't have to be, again, a $10,000 suit, but it could just be a nice shirt, a fitting shirt. It tells a lot about that person's character and what they feel about themselves because a lot of the times if someone is successful, it's because they're confident and they get their confidence because of the way that they show up every single day. And the way that they show up every single day has a little bit to do with their appearance, if nothing else. And so those are all the things that I try to look out for. But at the same time, those are the things that I try to pride myself on. And then at the end of the day, when I open up my mouth, I think is when people can really tell if I'm about what I, what I talk about or if I'm not. Well, you talked about success there, um, Casanova, and, and I think um, that's a good place to to start to understand kind of how you've achieved that success, really, and how you got into it. So I understand that you you've got a, a really challenging backstory. You you you've said that you're a stage four cancer survivor. I think you 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 lost your mum. Uh, uh, life sounded pretty tough. How did how did you get into uh, you know real estate and self development? What how did you become the Casanova Brooks that we see today? Yeah, so I, it's important to know that I didn't grow up with any of this. I grew up no financial literacy. Parents never owned a business, a house, car, nothing, no land, no anything. And so for me, I was just a young boy with big dreams. I always wanted to figure out how I could be a millionaire. I remember when I was like 13 years old, and I don't know where it came from or how I first got exposed to it, but I found the Forbes list. And so, you know, and even still now, you can go look at the top 400 like billionaires or millionaires. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was young and I was 
reading it. And I wasn't going back to my mom or anybody else telling them. It was just something that intrigued me. And so I think growing up with lack of, it always gave me the inspiration that one day I wanted. And so then basically I got exposed to network marketing and I always say that network marketing, it was a foundation for me. And even though that company that I was a part of, um, it, it, those products, those services were not for me, but the one thing that it did teach me was the foundations of becoming a millionaire or becoming a person that had, um, what's the best word? I guess I would say confidence in my abilities to make whatever dream that I had become a reality. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first book that I was exposed to through that was Richest Man in Babylon. And then I think I was also exposed to Go For No and just a lot of other books. But the really the one that changed everything for me in the beginning was a book called um, The Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DeMarco. And I don't know, have you ever read that book? I haven't. So Sounds it's a phenomenal good. book. And for a young guy like me with big dreams, big ambitions, it at least gave me some type of a foundation that it didn't feel like I was on a, a, a pipe dream because it sounds like it from the title. But when you go through and you read that book, it's, again, a phenomenal book. But then that was combined with the book of Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And so... I read those books and what it really taught me, because at this time on my daytime job, I'm selling cars. And so what that taught me is that I was trading my time for money. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sell a car if I wasn't at the dealership. So I started to figure out what are the ways that I could start to not have to trade time for money and I could build something that was going to appreciate and that was going to outlast me. And so I started going online and, and I had jobs along this way. I mean, I, I probably had 21, 22 different jobs, not wow. like things that I've done myself, but just trying so many different things. And this was early on, just me trying to figure out my way because again, I didn't have any blueprint. And really I came across a YouTube video and a guy had said, you got to find a way to be the Lord of your land. Why? Is because he or she who owns the land makes the rules. And okay. I was like, oh man. And, and, that, and for me growing up, my favorite game was always Monopoly. So I was like, oh, man, this is good. And then so I started to really dive deeper into it. And I didn't know anything about owning land, but he had started out as a celebrity realtor. And or, so basically he was just a realtor, but he was working with high profile athletes and celebrities and things like that. So he built a name really quickly. And I said, well, listen, I don't know how to be an investor or own land or, or be a part of a hedge fund or anything. But here's what I do know. I do know the basics of building relationships and serving other people. So how about I just get my real estate license? I can serve other people and help them buy, sell, or invest. And in return, I'll take my commissions and I'll buy my own real estate. And so that was the path that I really set out on. And from there, I've kind of stayed true to that journey. And for me, I think that a lot of people, they, they get stuck in one thing. And for me, I knew that real estate was going to be the thing that built my foundation. But real estate at the end of the day was never my why. It was just my what and my how. So what do I mean by that? I mean, it was never why I got up every morning, but it was what I did and, and how I've made my living. So I needed to go deeper and I needed to figure out what was my why, right? And that's where I started Dream Nation is at the end of the day, I know that everything starts with the dream. Mm -hmm. And those of us who dare to continue to dream while the rest of the world is settling, because so many people in this world, they just settle for the 40, 40, 40, right? They're going to work 40 years, work for we're going to work one job for 40 years. They're going to work on 40 hours a week and they're going to retire, hopefully on 40% of what they've earned. Mm -hmm. Right. But for me, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I also understood that a lot of people, their dream is something different. So I don't believe that any dream is smaller or bigger than anyone else's dream. And so I tried to, to create something that was bigger than me, which is dream nation. And the goal is to inspire everyone to live a life by their design, no matter what their dream is. You mentioned there about um, as you got into this, you already knew about building relationships. So how did, where did you learn that from? How did you develop your skill to build relationships? Yeah. So early on when I was uh, 10 years old, my grandma, it was, it, I was 10 or 11 years old and my grandma made the decision that she was going to move me out of Chicago to Sioux City, Iowa. So imagine young boy 
knowing nothing in this world, being moved from big city Chicago where only people look like me to then a town of 80,000 people, cornfield, cattles, where almost <laughs> no one looks like me. So I was wow. <laughs> huge culture change, right? And I had to figure it out, but I always say that there's a silver lining in everything. And for me, that silver lining was it didn't allow me to grow up with an ignorant mindset. And so what do I mean by that? The mindset of just because you do not look like me, it means that you have to be against me and there's no way that you could be with me. So early on, I had to figure out how was I going to build relationships with people because I knew that for me, the only way that I was going to stand out in this world was by the access and the relationships that I had. It was never going to be about what I knew or even necessarily who I knew. So what do I mean by that? I mean, one of the things that I learned how to articulate, and this was really about six years ago, was it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't even matter who you know. What's more important is who knows you. Okay. Who's willing to put their stamp of approval on your name? And so a great common analogy of what I always say is think about it. If you're going to a job interview or you're looking for any opportunity and you say, hey, it looks like, you know, Casanova, right? And they say, oh, yeah, you know, Casanova. And he says, yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. And then let's call this guy, John. John reaches back out to me and he says, hey, uh, I just wanted to know, do you know, let's call him Alan. Do you know Alan? And I say, well, I kind of know Alan. He seems like a good guy. Like, I, I don't really know him like that. Now, what's the chances or the opportunity that you have to land that job or whatever it is that you're looking for? It's probably, what, 50%? But let's say that I come back and I say, oh, man, absolutely I know Alan. Like, if you have an opportunity to get him on your team, you got to go for that because that's the best opportunity that I've seen in a long time. He hustles like no one else. That would be solid. Now, what's your chances of landing that opportunity, mm -hmm. right? It's probably a lot more close to 90, 95%. And so it's always about who knows you and the way that you leave a lasting impression on someone is you focus on what is the energy and the value that you can bring to someone else. And so for me, early on, I was doing the work. I just didn't necessarily know how to articulate it. But the way that I focused on building relationships with people was one, I wanted to solve whatever problem that they had, whether it was big or small. And normally, a lot of the times, I didn't have the resources or even the knowledge to solve it, but I'd hopefully built the relationship with someone who did. And so my goal was to be a connector in that form. And that was the way that I would add value to anyone who I came in contact with. And that helped me to build relationships from an early age. I see. So you, so your, your value, your dynamic in there was you were the guy that could connect those people, help that person, make their life better, easier, solve a problem. And you get known as being the person that, that brokers those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. But I didn't try to necessarily, you know, showcase myself as that. Sure. Really, I was the guy who just, I, I knew people, I would connect people. But really, the reason why I had so much influence, even at an early age, is because I just had good energy. And that was the only thing. I knew I could never control the results or the outcome, but I could control the energy that I brought to any relationship, to any environment. And so that's what I've always just tried to do. I understand that right now my motor runs at 100 miles an hour, but it won't always run this way because I know, right? Like the, eventually we all start to wear down and we get old. I mean, I would like to think that my motor is going to still be this fast at 85, 90 years old, but I can't control that. And that's just hoping for something. But right now I have the opportunity to, to not live off of hope, but to actually live off of action. And so every day I just try to focus on my energy. And I think that that's been the really defining factor in what's allowed me to get here is the energy that I've brought into every scenario, every relationship and every room. So I, I, I really, I can relate to that because, and, and I understand when you, your definition of energy, flipping heck, people have only got to watch one video of you and, and they get it because you're like, bam, how do you, how do you achieve that? How do you, how do you bring it? on a day when you're not feeling it? Yeah, great question. So I think every single day, the, the number one thing that I do when I'm not feeling it is there's two things. One, I understand that for the greats, right? For anybody that's great at anything, you have to understand that you have to be willing to perform at the highest level, even when you don't want to. So that was the first thing for me and how I did that, even if I didn't feel like it that day is one. I always look back at my son and I understand that every single day he's watching me every single day. He wants to see what's my energy like, not only how am I responding in times of my winning, but more importantly, how am I responding in times of adversity? 
And this was something that early on in my real estate career, someone had said to me, they said, hey, think about it like this. If your wife and your son could walk around and follow you, shadow you for one day, right, from eight to five, what would they say about your work ethic and how you deliver every single day? And I always kind of had that in the back of my mind to think like, if my son was watching me right now, would he be like, dad, this is really what you do all day? Like I, we could have went and got ice cream. We could have went to the park. Like you're not even doing nothing. <laughs> or like, does he say, man, like I'm proud of you. There were so many times that it, I probably might've given up on that. But the fact that you did not like, I'm proud of you. And so those are the moments that pull me through. But the other thing, I mean, to be honest, I look for inspiration just like everyone else. One of the people who have always, always inspired me, there's lots of people, but one of the person who's always inspired me has been Jack Canfield, um, okay. who wrote the book Chicken Soup for the Soul, mm -hmm. as well as the Success Principles. But another person, I guess if you could say more motivational, would be um, Jim Rohn. And so I've looked at Jim Rohn and Jim Rohn, I think that he's somebody who he's definitely inspired my journey. I've read so much of Jim Rohn and he's always just put things into a perspective um, that I guess the way that I could sum it up is don't wish that things were easier. Just wish you were stronger. Wish you were better. Yeah. <laughs> I love that phrase. So you bring the energy. You've got you've got some passion behind you, clearly. Um You've got things that motivate you, so your family, your children, um, your, your your aspiration to want to be successful, um, and uh, behind all of that, what's the big why for you? What's the big thing? Yeah, behind all of it, I think for me, it's just the curiosity of the unknown. I'll be honest, and this probably is a um, unorthodox or unconventional answer, but for me, it's the curiosity of the unknown. Whenever I start out to do something, I'm always thinking big picture. Like when I started my podcast in the beginning, I knew that I wanted to go get the world's biggest and brightest minds. Some people start out with their friends. For me, I started out and I was reaching out to the Grant Cardones, the Dean Graziosis, the Jack Canfields. I wanted to get the biggest name people. Mm -hmm. And why is because, I mean, it takes the same energy to go small as it does to go big. Right? You learn that in real estate. It takes the same amount of energy to try to get 10 doors that are all single family units that it does to try to get one 10 unit apartment complex. Right. And so for me, that was always something that I that I did. And so when I talk about the big why, I think at the end of the day, I wanted to be looked at as someone who, man, he continued to persevere every single day. And I wanted to look at for somebody who is out there and they want to do big things, but they don't even know that it's possible or they, they they don't have that inspiration. I want them to be able to look at me and truly just say, because of you, I didn't give up. Like that is the probably the vice that I have. Like I, I go crazy and I feel crazy a lot of the times, but it is those messages on LinkedIn or Instagram or, or the review on the podcast that says, hey, man, you inspired me and I love listening at these episodes. And so I think that it is the crazy people that, again, make this world a better place because they really create innovation. They create chaos, but that chaos in, in the end turns into success because there's somebody else that follows suit and then they help to make this world a better place. So that's what I would say at the end of the day. My, my thing is it's being a spiritual warrior and just knowing that what's for me is for me. And even if I don't win at whatever it is, it's not a failure. It's just a lesson learned. And what I have to do is go back. I have to optimize because I was probably halfway there, if not even more. But there was this one thing that I didn't do. And if I would have just did that one thing, I probably would have made it work. So now let's just go back to the drawing board. And the beauty of it is, is whether it's an investor that I'm trying to get to invest with me, whether it's a guest that I'm trying to get to come onto my podcast, whether it's someone I'm trying to get onto their podcast, whatever it is, there's always someone else out there just like it, right? So what do I mean by that is think about it. If I didn't get Grant Cardone, he's not the only person that's a pioneer, whether it's in his space or another space. So now I know what I did wrong or what I could have done better is even a, a better way to say it on with Grant Cardone. And so Grant Cardone says no. And 95% of the time, it's not a no. It's just a not right not now. now. And yeah. maybe you don't have the status or the leverage that they want to use, whatever it is um, that you can get them that this time. So then just go find someone else. But now you know what to tweak. Maybe it was they asked about your numbers and you didn't have the numbers. So next time you know that a person of that caliber might ask about your numbers. So go get the numbers or figure out a way to articulate it to where the numbers don't even come up. 
whatever it is that you have to do. But the beauty of it is, is there's no one way to skin a cat and there's not only one cat. You just have to keep grinding, keep persevering, and you have to have a calling that someone else can get behind, a mission that someone else can get behind. And a lot of the times the ways that you do that is just by figuring out who you are at the end of the day. And I know that at the end of the day, I'm a big dreamer, but I'm also a doer. And I feel like a lot of people resonate with that. So that's why it's been easy for me to be able to get big name guests on easier, I guess, than the average person, but it's because they rock with my energy. And so I know this energy is going to take me to wherever I'm trying to go. Yeah. I like that. It, uh, <laughs> it's just as, uh, it's the same energy to work small or to work big. It's a nice phrase. Um, so looking across kind of your portfolio of, of interest, the, the range of things you do, you know, you've got the podcasting, um, speaking, Dream Nation Academy, the real estate side, which, which bit gives you the most satisfaction? Yeah, definitely the podcast gives me the most satisfaction. Okay. Uh, and, and because it's an opportunity for this content to live on, but it's an opportunity. I look at Dream Nation, again, it's something that's bigger than me. I could have kept building my personal brand, and yes, I am building this personal brand. But after about a year, as I was building out Casanova, the one thing that I noticed is that I wanted to build something that was bigger than me. And that's why I created Dream Nation. And so it's kind of the Robin Hood effect. I understand that not everybody would be able to have Grant Cardone's time or Dean Graziosi's time or anyone else, right? And so for me, I look at that and I say, if I have this one hour, this two hours, however long that it is, how can I make sure that I ask the questions to be a Robin Hood for the people who wouldn't have this access? And so that's what I would say gives me the most gratification is, and on top of that, you know, it gives me a platform to be able to get business coaching, even for that one hour, which can help me out tremendously. And it gives me perspective that even if I'm dealing with imposter syndrome in whatever area, or if I'm dealing with, you know, how do I become a better leader or a better father, being able to bring many experts on to give me a different perspective is what keeps me exposed and keeps me feeling alive. Because when I hop off of those interviews or those conversations, it's feeling like, oh, I have something that not only I can implement, but I can share back with the world to hopefully someone else can implement. And at the end of the day, they say, thank you. I was almost on the verge of just quitting. But when I heard that episode, it allowed me to know that I wasn't alone. And so that's what gives me the most satisfaction. Help me understand, because you you have um, the Dream Nation, then you have a, a specifically a real estate focused podcast, don't you? Are they both live and active or is one more? Do you- Yeah. So for me, when I first started out, I had Dream Nation and it was Mm -hmm. everything that I've already told you. But then after episode 100, what we wound up doing was we surveyed our audience and the audience came back and they say, hey, you know what, Casanova, we love your story. We love the people that we're bringing that you're bringing on the show. But the one thing we would love to learn more about is how you've done what you've done in real estate because that's where you really like came onto the scene. And so I was like, okay, great. Well, it gave me an opportunity to be a little bit more niche right? Mm-hmm. Because now I'm, I'm more so targeting a specific audience. Um, and, and then I'm also teaching things that are more tangible because then if people can use this to sell more houses or to even invest into more properties or understand how to build a fund, all these other things, which is why I built the Dream Nation real estate podcast. So if you think of it overall, Dream Nation is more of a media company. What we want to do is we want to share, we want to inspire, we want to educate, we want to entertain. So we want to share inspire, educate, and entertain. And with the real estate podcast, it just gave us another way to be able to talk to a specific audience. So now we can talk broad, but we can also talk niche. Cool. And in the broad one with the Dream Nation podcast, for those people not familiar of it, um, with it, which, which episode would you say people should dive into first that gives them the best taste? Yeah, so the, I have, I've had some phenomenal episodes, but a couple of them that stick out and come to my mind, number one would be Jack Canfield. Uh-huh. I had him on the show and he had a phenomenal episode. And then if you're a lady, if you're a woman, whether you're a mom or whether you're a new entrepreneur, whatever it might be, um, I would say a phenomenal one would be um, Marshawn Evans Daniels. And so she is the author of Believe Bigger. And so she has a phenomenal episode and I've gotten a lot of crazy feedback off of hers and I'm just a big fan of hers. So I would say, on, and and, and it all depends on where you are in your journey. I would say the one that I did with uh, Billie Jean was a really good one as well. But yeah, I would say those two have been um, some of the ones that, that often come to mind. I would also say... Ep- 
and I know I'm giving out a couple of them, but I would also say if you're looking for someone who has a no quit mentality that has gone through even maybe crazier storms than I have, there's episode 100 of the Dream Nation podcast with a lady, Rhonda Britton. And so she okay. had a phenomenal story. And uh, I'm always praising about her story, too, because it's one that I think many of us would it would be very hard to come back from, especially of how she's done it and how she helps people and the masses now. OK, cool. So that's episode 100. I think Marshawn was episode 151 and 152, if I remember rightly, off the top of my head. I'm obviously. Yeah, I think I think it was. Yeah, she (laughs) phenomenal story as well. And she just helps so many women. So if there's a woman that's listening to this and you're you're, you're being challenged by your faith, definitely go listen at that episode because she gives off so much wisdom. Cool. And I'll put the links to all of this stuff, obviously, in the in the podcast show notes when we go out with the episode. Okay, so change of tack. What makes you laugh? My daughter. (laughs) Yeah, my daughter makes me laugh. And it's just because she's such like my son, anyone who gets to meet him, he's so cool, calm, collected. His whole life, he gives a lot of energy. Don't get me wrong. If you think my energy is on 10, his energy is really on 15. (laughs) So he has a lot of energy, as most nine-year-old boys do. But he's definitely like can never sit down to the point that we have looked at when we move out in Nebraska because he needs to be outside all year round. Like He's just always going and a good energy too, not like – ADHD energy, but nothing wrong with ADHD. Just so people like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying he has a good energy that's always on basketball, football. Like, I love him. Now, going back to my daughter, she her. They're two totally different kids. He came out cool, cool, calm, and collected. My daughter came out, and we always make the joke now, but it's very serious. She's either going to end up in jail one day, or she's going to be president. Like, she is a (laughs) firecracker. And just or maybe like the outgoing she's... president, uh, president, and then in jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, we Sorry. hope not. We hope she never makes it. But she <laughs> just—I'll be honest. Even this morning, I got a call from my my wife, and she's like, "Can you talk to your daughter, or you're gonna have to come get her?" Because she she left out this morning, and she was fine. But then all of a sudden, she must have went through some type of a meltdown or, or something else. And so just her personality every day. I've even had videos that we definitely feel like could go viral. Um, that we haven't put out there. But yeah, my daughter makes me laugh. And I think a lot of things make me laugh, but she would be the number one because the the wittiness that she has at the age of three of what she says, how she says it uh, is, is just something that my wife and I, we've never experienced. So yeah, that's what I would say. I that's imagine. the first thing that came to my mind. Oh, fantastic. And when it's time to switch off and just get away from the 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 frenetic world that it appears to me that you occupy. Um, how do you relax? Great question. I would honestly say, and if you're asking my wife and she's sitting right here, I don't. Um, <laughs> and, and that could be a problem maybe down the road, but it's hard for me to relax because I feel like at the end of the day, there's still so much left for me to accomplish. And me being a stage four cancer survivor and going through two years of chemotherapy, I understand that tomorrow's never promised. And so yeah. I think, you know, one of the, the things that I always say, and I understand that my body is my temple, but for me, I love what I'm doing. And so I'm always constantly researching, optimizing, taking action on something, regardless if it's what someone else thinks that I be, should be doing or not. I'm taking action on something. So I don't necessarily think that I take a lot of time to just let down because I can always find another way to tie in whatever I'm doing into business. So prime example, even if I'm just watching Netflix and I'm watching a show, I think if I see something that's witty, whether it's in business or whether it's with the, like, I always tie that back into something that I could be doing. And that could just be making a piece of content, sharing what I've already learned, or that could be an inspirational piece of how someone was persistent. And I still know that I want to go get Will Smith or someone on my show. So it tells me like, now I got to get to work. And so I don't know that I ever do really take time off, but it's something, but I think it's because it's something that I love doing. What's the last thing you watched on Netflix? Well, I would say deaf comedy jam. Cause I was oh, at okay. a client yesterday. I had a listing appointment and I was, and they were watching it. So that was the last thing I watched on Netflix. Okay. See, I remember the early deaf jam days. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it was. It was back. It was their 25 a year anniversary. So yeah. they were showing all of the pioneers, Eddie Murphy, Martin Lawrence, uh, and all of them. So yeah, that's what they were watching when I went over there. 
I went to see, um, in the early days of Def Jam music, I went to see Public Enemy in 1986 mm. at uh, Hammersmith Odeon in London. I am... Uh, I was a huge fan. I still am, really, of, of, of certainly mid to late 80s hip-hop. I became a bit obsessed with it. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you cannot convince me that what's, um, what's out now is, is any better. But we may have to agree to disagree. You may have a different opinion about music. What do you listen to? Um, so I'm a huge, huge Drake fan. Okay. Uh, I'm also a huge, huge Jay-Z fan. So uh-huh. I'm kind of in that those middle stages. I don't listen to the music that really comes out today as as hard as I used to. But those mid, you know, Jay Z was obviously a huge, yeah, huge pioneer yeah. in hip hop. Uh, obviously, coming after Run DMC and and everyone else that really built the hip hop community. But those are the people I would listen to. I'm a huge Jake fa- Drake fan, huge Jay Z fan, and I hope to get them on the Dream Nation podcast sooner rather than later. That would be an episode to listen to for sure. Oh yeah. Given that you've got all this stuff happening and you've got a lot on, what's the top thing that makes you? Because it would be very easy, I would imagine, to uh, to be busy, but to be a busy fool. So, what's the top thing you do that that makes you productive? Great question. The top thing that I do that makes me productive, I would say. I think I continuously am exposed to something of inspiration because a lot of times the reason why we don't do something is because we're not inspired to do it. We could be motivated, but at the end of the day, that carrot, whatever that's dangling out there, you can talk into your mind to why you don't need that carrot. So then you're like, ah, I don't need to do it. But when you're inspired, it's something that pulls you through. I think there's a difference. So I know there's a difference between motivation and inspiration. And so for me, I always try to find a way to have inspiration rather than just motivation because motivation is short term. But inspiration and figuring out what is that why for me and building something that's way bigger than me at the end of the day, no different to what than what Richard Branson has done, no different than what even Warren Buffett's done. They've inspired the masses. So that's always been my goal. So I think the thing that I've been able to do is continue to expose myself to something different that's allowed me to be inspired. So whether that's a new book, whether that is a new podcast or something that can allow me to say, again, Casanova, you still got work to do. So that's what keeps me productive. That's really interesting, actually. I know I never looked at it that way. The inspiration and motivation are different in that way. So motivation is a short term thing that, you know, I can get motivated today. But inspiration is kind of my North Star, the thing that pulls me forward all the time. Yeah, is absolutely. I mean, yeah. th- that's what we do. We, we we motivate someone by dangling money or some type of a carrot, time off, whatever it might be in your industry that you're doing. But mm-hmm. but that person will never, if you're inspired by something, that's a, that's lifetime, right? Think about the, the greats of, like I mentioned, Will Smith. Right. He's inspired, but and he's he's inspired people that now have seven, eight, nine figure businesses. And they think back to everything that he's done over the course of his career. So, yes, I always think that inspiration is more of a lifetime and motivation. It will, you know, wear off. And that's where the Zig Ziglar quote comes in and it, that he says, like, yeah, motivation is just like bathing. It will wear mm. off. So you have to do it continuously every single mm. day. But like if I'm inspired by having kids, if, if someone else is inspired by me having kids, like that's that's something that they're trying to achieve because they know that it's going to change for them for a lifetime. So, yeah, that's always the way that I love to look at it. I think that um, one of the things, in fact, I mean, we've been working on an episode today around um, work life balance. And I think one of the one of the the things that people sometimes miss out on is that people can get very focused on work whatever whatever work may be, whether that's working in a store, whether that's building up a, um, a, a property portfolio. But actually, there are many aspects to life, you know, the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, the spiritual. Do you set goals for those sorts of things as well? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first thing I would say is, I don't think that there's a such thing, and I learned this, but I don't think that there's a such thing as a work-life balance. Um, because I think if you really love what you're doing and, and you're going hard at who you are, right, then it's going to intertwine. And I think when you're talking about balancing, most of the time you have to take away from one to give to the other. If you think about a scale, Right. And there's two things on or there's one thing on both sides. You have to take away some pounds to give to the other. So for me, what I learned early on was instead of trying to balance things to figure out a way that you can harmonize them. Mm. 
And a lot of the times what that means is communication. For me, I've just worked tirelessly over the last couple of years to make sure that my wife and I, and even the kids and I, we have great communication. If mm. I know that I have a podcast that I need to record, I communicate that with my wife, whether that's through my calendar or even communicating it with her in the morning to where she knows like, hey, I need good energy today. And so like Grant Cardone, like she knew that that was coming up. And so she's like, hey, just want to let you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm supporting you. You're going to crush it, whatever it might be. And so it's all about the communication. And it's just like that in any relationship. The better that you can communicate, the better off that you'll be. And as far as if I set goals, I absolutely set goals. I've done vision boards um, and I try to not focus. Yes, I'm always a big picture thinker. And and that could... That, they used to get me in trouble a lot more, but even I would say it can still get you into trouble because one of the things is if you would classify yourself as a visionary, you have to make sure that you have somebody that can be your COO who can really have strategy. I'm not talking about the execution, but the mm -hmm. strategy behind it. And so for me, that's what I focused on is developing my team because I have a lot of big goals and I have a lot of big, and I have those, as they call them, uh, bag goals, which is big, hairy, audacious goals, <laughs> right? Like I say, I wanted to get Grant Cardone on my show and I did it. I said, I wanted to get all these other people on my show and I did it. And I know that it's only a matter of time before other people come on as well. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you break those down, break those down into bite size chunks and just like the the quote going what's the quote says what's the best way to eat an elephant mm. it's one bite at a time and mm. so for me having people around that can take my vision my big goals and they can break those down into not only strategy but also here's peace here's a piece here's a piece and here's how we're going to execute on those pieces i think that the team aspect has allowed me um to really go further faster than i could have alone because trying to be all things to myself is a problem. And this kind of really came to me when I read the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Um, and that was another where I was like, man, I'm being the visionary. I'm the technician. I'm the manager. I can't be everything. And so, yes, I write those down. But at the same time, I have a team that helps me to carry them out and execute them. You, talk, you, you said there about vision and strategy, and then, but, but it can get you into trouble. Tell me about what trouble you've got into. Yeah. So I think when you're talking about vision, sometimes you can scare other people. Right. And, and I think that I've done it. It's almost like throwing up on someone. You have this energy and, not, <laughs> and, and, and people do love the energy that I have. But there's been times where I've had somebody and I couldn't necessarily articulate. I knew where I was going, but I couldn't necessarily articulate the strategy or even how I was going to execute on it. And so other people, you know, they say that one of the quickest ways to kill a dream is to introduce it to a small mind. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say that some people have been small minded, but if they've never been exposed to that and all of a sudden you get exposed to an opportunity, it's just like for us, think about if you had, if Mark Zuckerberg would have brought to you and whoever's listening to this, think about if Mark Zuckerberg would have brought to you the idea that Apple, or I'm sorry, not Apple. I was thinking of Apple because it's like, okay, even Steve Jobs. But let's keep yeah. it back on Mark Zuckerberg. The idea that Facebook would be, you know, a multi-billion dollar company, but you just needed to invest 100000 today in it, right? That vision, everything, it would have been, oh, man, that's so great. But would you have taken advantage of the opportunity? Now, granted, that was back 2005 where we weren't as exposed to all these opportunities. But let's even just say over the last couple of years, you have something like a Zoom. Right. If you would have been exposed to the opportunity of Zoom, would you have would you have invested fifty thousand dollars into it? Mm. And mm. so sometimes people can't see, you know, past the the tree because the forest of what they've been exposed to just seems so big. And they're like, ah, they're just only focused on the tree. So I think that that's happened to me many of times and it's allowed me to just slow down. Now, it is a numbers game because I have also found the major players on my team that said, hey, you know what? We love the vision. We do want to run with you. But there's a lot of people who in the beginning, I thought that we could really build something that would be you know, magnified, but then come to find out a couple of days later, they grow, they've ghosted me. And it's like, what happened? It was just, they weren't ready for the opportunity. And it kind of the saying goes, you know, um, your circle will get smaller because everybody won't grow. And so that's, that's one of the things that I guess I would say. And there's many a times that it's happened to me again, it's always, cause I'm always pitching the vision and most yeah. people, they, they, they can't see it. Well, and I can see that it could be <clears throat> intimidating might be too strong a word, but for some people it might be, this is too much. It's not for mm -hmm. me. Uh, I, I can I can see that. It's an interesting challenge. 
It is. And that's why I say, I mean, you just, there's a book out there and I know I'm dropping a lot of books, but I love to be as transparent as possible. But there's a book out there by a guy um, and his name is, I want to say it's Gino Wickman. He wrote the book Rocket Fuel. Okay. And, and if you haven't read that, I would encourage you to read it, whoever's listening at this. But uh, it really taught me the difference between a visionary, right? And a, and integrator is what it is, a visionary and an integrator. And at the time I was trying to be both, but he said, you know, there's very, very few people in this world that are both. And for me, I looked at it and as I started to read and it didn't take me but about four pages and I screenshotted it, I sent it to my wife, everything. And it really taught me that I was a visionary. So then I worked tirelessly on trying to figure out who on my team could be an integrator. And fortunately enough for me, I've been able to find that one, but that's what I would say. Just make sure that you're focused on whatever your strength is. And if you're already an integrator, then that just means maybe you need to bring in a visionary, but understand that people are the key to your success because they'll help you to go further faster than you would alone. And then after you get that person, just make sure that you don't build it off of that person. You build it off of systems. Okay. Final question. What should I have asked you that I haven't asked you? That's a great question. I stole it from Dan Harris. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, all good. So I would say the thing that's allowed me to really have success over these over my lifetime, but really over the last 10 years, it's really understanding that the three E's are everything to anyone's success. And what are those three E's? I mentioned them kind of briefly early on, but number one is your energy. What is your energy that you bring every single day to every situation? Number two is the environment. A lot of times we want to level up, we want to mentor, we want to coach, but not only are you the sum of the five people who you surround yourself with the most, right? And your network becomes your net worth. But at the end of the day, you also have to ask yourself, who do you need to become to continue to have them be surrounded by you? Because it's not about just who do I need to, who do I need to network with, but who do I need to become to be able to continue to network with these people. So that's the second thing that I would say. And the last one is exposure. For us as a young kid, we're exposed to so many things, which allows us to dream, which allows us to feel alive, which allows us to every single day feel like that something, our future is brighter than ever, is, is as plain as day, right? Our future is always as brighter than ever. But when we get to 16, 17, sometimes even earlier, unfortunately, we then put ourselves in bad environments or we allow ourselves to stay in environments that take away from that passion, that energy and our excitement. And then before we know it, we're living in fear and we're living in doubt. And so for me, I've continued to expose myself to new things that allow me to just be who I am, which is a young kid with big dreams, big goals, and big ambitions. So you focus on those three E's, your energy, your environment, and your exposure every single day. And there's no way that you won't execute on making your dream a reality. Wow, that sounds like a fantastic place to bring things to a close. Energy, environment, and exposure. Um, That's really cool. Casanova, um, please tell our listeners where they should go to find out about you, the socials, the websites, where should people find out more? Yeah. So the cool spot uh, that I hang out at is Instagram for now. You can also find me on Clubhouse, which has been uh, something that I've tried to slow down on because just like the rest of the world, it's it's taken over my life. Noble. Um, yeah. But Instagram, LinkedIn, I'm very accessible. And if you want to find out more about the podcast and, and our community that we've built, you can head on over to dreamnation.com. Okay. And Instagram, what are you called on Instagram? Yeah, it's Casanova underscore Brooks. So just one S in Casanova, C-A-S-A-N-O-V-A underscore Brooks. And from there, you can find out everything about me as well. Thank you ever so much for spending time with us. Um, We really appreciate it. Um, All of the links to your website, the podcast, which is excellent, by the way. Uh, I feel like I'm part of the family that you refer to now when when you You open the podcast. You absolutely (laughs) are. Uh, and I'll make sure my listeners are part of the family too. Um, thank you ever so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, I have you, hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks ever so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you, my brother. Whoa, I told you it was a full episode. Wow. So, what did we learn? We learned about the importance of building relationships and connecting people. 
we learned about thinking about the energy that we bring to a relationship. We learned that if we want help to perform even when we don't want to, you can imagine that your kids are watching you. Don't wish things were easier, wish you were stronger. That it takes the same amount of energy to go small as it does to go big. We learn to break your big goals down into bite-sized chunks to execute the pieces. We learn that it isn't just that there's not only one way to skin a cat, but there isn't only one cat. And we learn work, life, harmony comes through communication. And motivation is short-term and inspiration is long-term. And we finish with the three E's. Your energy, your environment and exposure. Now the links to dreamnation.com Casanova's resource and all the books and links that he talks about they're all in the show notes if you want to find out more you can have a look either in your podcast app or at sharppodcast.com I love chatting with Casanova and don't forget to look at all the resource I'm off for a cup of tea and a game of Monopoly see you next time we hope that you enjoyed what you've just listened to have a look at the show notes for the episode they're at sharppodcast.com one word, two Ps. And there you'll see the links, resources that we used, and there's reminders there to help you get better at what we talked about. You know, making this podcast is a labour of love, and we genuinely do it for one reason, to help you. And we want to help as many people as we can, but to do that, we need your support. So now this is where you can help us. Firstly, you can help us in ways that don't cost you any money. You can share our episodes on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. We are at Sharp Podcast, one word, two Ps. You could send a link to a friend or help them subscribe on their device. And another free way you can support is to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your Podcatcher app. And if you are in a position to contribute a small amount financially, you could buy me a coffee. Go to the website sharppodcast.com and click on the orange button and you can buy me a coffee you can buy me two coffees you can do it as a one-off or you can do it regularly it's up to you if you can help it will go some way to supporting the cost of the gear the software and the stuff that i invest in to help you so next time you make a coffee or you buy one for a friend don't forget your friend at sharp podcast thanks for your help it's really appreciated bye-bye Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear wow. me? Wow. Yes, I can. And I can't okay. hear me, which is better for me. Cool. <laughs> and, and the audience. Good. Well, I think we should be good to go. One of me is enough. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Casanova. That's, that's brilliant stuff. Okay, let's kick off. So, um,